Yeah, good morning to everybody. It is, uh, it's uh, Canon Institute. And uh, we're half today and haven't Russian independent media during the coronavirus pandemic. My name is Sergei Parfemka. I'm a senior advisor at the Canon Institute. Uh, and uh, I'm also a host of Such Sabuiti on Moscow Radio. I'm journalist for more or less uh, 40 years uh, now. Uh, we will talk today about Russian media at the time of the pandemic. Uh, how is the information industry going through the crisis in a country where the authoritarian regime is trying to make the work of journalists as difficult as possible and uh, take any publication, both public or private, under more and more strict control? Uh, how is the role of the media change, changing when society is uh, sized by anxiety and fear and uh, is increasingly suffering from a lack of truthful information? How are journalists surviving when their usual relation with readers, viewers, subscribers and advertising, advertisers are collapsing? Uh, I think uh, you will have some question today uh, for our panel. Please send them by email to canon at wilsoncentral.org, by Twitter uh, at Canon Institute or our Facebook page. So all said, we are, we are all on the air. Uh, uh, we have today Tihan Zivko, a journalist uh, and the editor in chief of uh, TV Rain, Dost, uh, the only independ Hi. independent TV station in Russia. Hi, Hi Tihan. Uh, Hi, also, we have, we have Grigory Yudin, uh, a professor of political philosophy at Moscow School of Social and Economic Science. Hi, Grigory. Uh, we have also Galina Timchenka. A uh, Russian famous journalist and uh, executive editor of Medusa, based in Riga, Hi. Hi. but working in Russian for Russian audience. Hi, Galina. And the fourth one is Raman Badanin. Raman Badanin is the founder and editor in chief of the project Project, an independent investigative med media outlet. Hi, Raman. Hi. So uh, I think. I think I will start. I will start by uh, by Tihan. Uh, Tihan, you are uh, you are the chef of the of the media. Was basis uh, of existence in normal life and in normal time is uh, the sub subscriber, and uh, it's uh, your main main income now. Uh, your main support. Uh, at the first mom moment, it seems to me that uh, under these circumstances, people do not want to spend money on anything but their own survival. Uh, have your relation with subscribers changed in some different way? Uh, do you feel any other public attitude toward you? And uh, under these circumstances, uh, uh, are you surviving more or less? And uh, what is your situation in, in, this, in this difficult time? Thanks. Well, uh, first of all, uh, thanks for having me here and uh, hello to everyone. Uh, the situation on Dost is never easy. Uh, over the last 10 years that Dost exists and it's a difficult time for us now, just like for all the uh, small and uh, medium-sized businesses uh, in Russia. Uh, because we don't get any, we don't get any support from the government. All we got are some sort of restrictions. Uh, that's true that our business model is based on uh, is mostly is mostly based on uh, subscriptions from uh, our viewers. But uh, ironically, maybe this is the fact that helps us uh, survive now, because our small income from advertising has fallen critically. It's something like 70% or, or 60%. Uh, because businesses, they don't have money for that or they 
they they don't see any sense in giving us uh, uh, advertising since they are closed all. But uh, in this situation, uh, we here on Dost we see two trends. The first is that the amount of our audience is growing. Uh, for example, in March, our audience on our and the traffic on our website uh, were 105 percent more than in February. In April, we had less viewers on our website than in March, but still much more than in the previous uh, month. Uh, I think uh, that is because people are eager to get information about coronavirus. They are eager to get information about the uh, uh, measures that are being taken by the government. They are eager, eager to get um, information about the uh, political and uh, economical uh, consequences of these uh, decisions, especially since these last uh, weeks, uh, since the beginning of uh, March, I guess, we are producing more news shows than before the start of the uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic and the regime of so-called self-isolation in, uh, in Russia. The second trend is that uh, we are getting more subscribers. Thus, that means that we are getting more money from uh, our viewers. Uh, I think because people are ready to... people don't believe the uh, official information, they don't believe uh, official media, and they are ready, or at least were ready to pay for the independent journalism and uh, to support independent journalism, to get information about the real situation with the uh, coronavirus and about the conditions uh, in which doctors are working, a uh, situation that patients are facing, uh, in, in, in Moscow and especially in uh, in the Russian region, these are good trends in our situation. The bad fact is that the money that we are getting on uh, subscriptions are still less than the money that we lost on the crash of the uh, advertising market. That's why we had to cut our costs, and that's why we had, for example, to cut salaries of all who work for for the Dosh. And also we realize that very soon the number of those who are ready to pay for the subscription will fall because the first thing, people just don't have enough money. They need money to buy food. And uh, during these last weeks of so-called non-working weeks, uh, they, they haven't get, got the money. And the second thing is that the um, uh, the nothing is happening. Nothing is happening. It's it's boring for the people to open the website every morning and see that nothing has changed. So I I am afraid that our bad times are are coming. Uh, the situation now is is not as bad as I was uh, expecting. I would say. Uh, three weeks ago, but I think that the number of subscriptions will uh, fall, and I don't think that the uh, advertising market will somehow, uh, will somehow resurrect uh, anytime soon. Thank you, Tichon. It was my second question to Galina, just uh, about uh, nothing happens uh, except coronavirus. Uh, do, do you think that Russian non-state media uh, managed to keep attention to other stories, uh, which is uh, the peacetime, uh, where the main, uh, the, the main and the, 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 the most, the most important uh, political fight and uh, power and civil rights and corruption and repressive uh, laws and the economy and the war in Ukraine. Uh, is it all this still exists for, for you and for your audience, except yeah. coronavirus? Uh, 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 I want to say hi one more, more time and thank you for having me here. And um, speaking about uh, audience habits or audience patterns, I could say that uh, unfortunately or fortunately, we could see decrease of interest uh, for uh, other agenda except COVID 
or accept epidemi epidemic uh, situation in Russia. You know, uh, we could see decrease uh, of our infotainment rubrics, and we could see huge growth of interest and huge growth of uh, uh, um, our audience attention to explanatory journalism and to reporting. Uh, and uh, um, uh, what I could say, uh, I um, I see huge interest about uh, situation in Russian regions and about human touch stories, about medicine, about um, ambulance, about all the situation with uh, uh, lockdown of uh, streets and uh, and it was not very surprisingly for me, but it's very interesting. But people uh, want to uh, understand very deeply all statistics, all analyzes, all prognosis based on science. We uh, asked um, famous Russian scientists to uh, work with us on this mathematical scheme or uh, this mathematical, uh, mathematical uh, model to uh, make some prognosis and it was huge attention. We made special interactive maps or tables uh, with um, COVID infected people, uh, with numbers and with Russian regions. And we, uh, we've got more than 2 million unique, uh, uh, 2 million page views, just only for map and for table. Uh, so explanatory journalism rules for now. And unfortunately, there is no attention to any, anything, maybe except Ukraine situation, because they're neighbors and it's very hot topic or maybe uh, accept some economical situation. And it's vital for our audience. But all infotainment uh, um, stuff, all news gaming, Medusa is famous for news gaming. Uh, that's all uh, in, in uh, very slow, but sliding now. Thank you, Galina. Uh, now for Roman, uh, is the investigative journalism rules? Uh, because we have a special uh, special media very pointed to investigative journalism and uh, on the corruption on the some special situation inside russian uh, russian power maybe it's not a good time for all this maybe maybe now we have to to combat coronavirus and then we will we will restart to to write about uh, about corruption what what is your vision? Hi all guys and um, again thank you for having us all here today. Uh, so Sergei, uh, thank you for your question. It's a little bit provocative, I would say. Uh, I mean, uh, can you imagine that I say sure, provocative? <laughs> yeah, that that I say. Well, the investigative journalism doesn't matter. No, of course. So uh, I've got some figures. I'm going to share with you. Look, uh, at the very beginning of April, uh, we released a big piece. Uh, simultaneously, it was text and it was video story. Uh, it was about uh, absolutely luxurious, but at the same time, absolutely clandestine mansion, which is owned by the company presumably linked to Russian ex prime minister, Mr. Medvedev. Uh, that article had absolutely nothing in common with the coronavirus issue, absolutely at all. Uh, but after all, it had, it was read and watched approximately, in overall, approximately by half a million of people. In terms of our, I mean the project, in terms of our average reach, that is very good. At the same time, I have an opposite example. Uh, uh, just two weeks ago, two or so weeks ago, uh, we have published a story on the coronavirus outbreak in Ulyanovsk region. And in my view, it was really socially important article, which makes a difference. It was an article with a substantial scoop inside. And all of a sudden, that piece went completely unnoticed 
I mean, completely under the radar. The total amount of views was kind of, I don't remember, like uh, 20,000 views, which is bad from my point of view. And I have a third example, except that article on Ulyanovsk, so far we have released in overall four stories on topics, I mean, four big stories on topics somehow related to the coronavirus issue. In average, every one of them had about a hundred thousands of views, again, which is very good in terms of our scale. What I'm going to say with all these examples. Conclusion number one, of course, the coronavirus is the topic of greatest demand right now. And, I, and in, in this term, I completely agree with uh, Galina. And all the newsrooms, including our newsroom, had to revise our editorial plans in order to give more visibility to coronavirus and to postpone some other topics. The conclusion number two, at the same time, the coronavirus outbreak doesn't necessarily mean that people are, are not interested in other topics of great social importance. That's an example of this story on corruption uh, around Dmitry Medvedev. For me, it means that we cannot stop our excavations into corruption or whatever unrelated to coronavirus. And conclusion number three, uh, it's a little bit funny. Uh, it was a little bit surprising for me uh, as a media manager. The mentioning of coronavirus in the article is not a guarantee of its potential higher reach. It's kind of phenomenon, but it works. Uh, yeah, well, that's my overview, I would say. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you, Raman. Uh, before before the last participant of our our panel, I I will remind to our audience: if you have questions, feel free to send this question to our panel. Please send them by email to Canon at Wilson Center or by Twitter or Canon Institute and our Facebook page. And uh, now, Greg, you, can, you are not journalist, you are political scientist, you are uh, observers. So uh, what, is, what is the theory of this, of this uh, difficult time? Is it, is it exist already some uh, theoretical view on the role of, of media on the time of, uh, of um, epidemia? Is it changed something? Is it, is it just the same? Because if 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 we if we we, we see the the, the answers of uh, our editor in chiefs, uh, almost nothing changes. Uh, people continue to be interested on all the spectrum of uh, of, of problems. What is what is you you vision of this? You ready? Uh, yeah. First of all, thank you, Sergey, for for inviting me. I'm, I'm indeed not a journalist, but I'm happy to to join the, the three prominent Russian journalists. I'm doing political theory, uh, and for that reason, I'm kind of interested in this case, in how the media see their uh, their function, their mission at this troubling moment. And uh, well, there is uh, a model that uh, kind of helps me understand what is going on uh, here with the media at this moment. Uh, generally, you can differentiate between uh, two uh, visions of uh, what journalism is about. Uh, it kind of uh, refers back to the discussion that uh, uh, took place in the United States back in 1920s uh, between uh, two political thinkers, Walter Lippmann and John Dewey. Uh, so Lippmann was a proponent of the uh, top-down model, uh, meaning that uh, the public is uh, hopelessly incompetent and the, the journalist's mission is uh, mainly to inform the public about the decisions made by the leaders. 
while Dewey was much more optimistic, believing that the public is capable of uh, competent uh, decisions, of making competent decisions, but it has to be um, enlightened by, by the journalists uh, who provide additional expertise in order for the public to make uh, decisions. And of course, you can uh, see both of these uh, models in Russia uh, even before the, before the pandemic. Um, uh, and of course, I'm, I'm glossing here over many other uh, differences, but uh, obviously some of the media inform the audience about the ready-made decisions, while others are more willing to promote public engagement uh, in solving issues of, of common interest. And what is interesting uh, to me during this pandemic is that the, the information model, the, the top-down model, has failed notoriously. Because the, stale, the state-controlled media seem to be perfectly set to give uh, full explanations and justifications of the actions of the Russian government so that the citizens could understand the, the rationale behind certain epidemiological measures. I mean, for many years, the state-controlled TV chains were basically trained to be the spokesman for the government, uh, eliminating all rival viewpoints. And yet suddenly, when there is a true request for consistent explanation of the government's policy, they uh, fail completely to deliver a consistent narrative. Uh, or if you turn on the TV chains, you'll find one of them, like inviting experts who are boasting that Russia is only slightly hit by the pandemic, that this is a miraculous virus that somehow doesn't affect Russians uh, at all, or that there are scientific reasons to believe that the virus is really dangerous only for certain races or for certain ethnicities. And the general mood is, uh, well, calm down, that's a minor issue, there's nothing much to do about it. Then we switch the channel, and you see another state-ruled TV chain demonstrating horrible pictures of people uh, in intensive care, long lines of ambulance cars at the emergency room, and the anchors literally like yelling at the audience, it's like, stay home if you don't want to die. Uh, there's no one to save you anymore. And the result, of course, is enormous confusion. Uh, and the, the result is that people uh, are not always abiding by the, by the rules introduced by the government because they simply don't understand them. Uh, and add to this that there is no official spokesperson on, on coronavirus uh, in the government to explain the government's response. And it's interesting to me that while this top-down uh, model uh, fails badly, the bottom-up media uh, tend to assume the, the responsibility for, uh, for informing the audience about uh, the actual development of the pandemic and also about the meaning of the official policies, something uh, that uh, Galina has referred to. And uh, kind of strangely, it is easier to find rationale behind the government's response, like watching or reading independent media, rather than by watching the state-run TV stations. I mean, as a, as a, as a reader, I've, I started watching and reading all those media uh, mentioned here uh, much more often than previously. Uh, of course, I don't mean that they, they abandon critical journalism, of course. Um, there are many uh, interesting investigations coming out related to the pandemic, but the interesting outcome to me, like the bottom line of that all, is that probably this pandemic shows that the deepening, there is a deepening crisis of the top-down model in Russia. Actually, some signs of this crisis were already obvious last year when it became apparent that uh, the, the audience of this top-down model of the uh, state-controlled TV media has shrunk into some 35 or 40% of the population, and the younger people obviously prefer in the, the social media and the other mode. But now it suddenly fails to do the only thing it was kind of supposed to do, to communicate the clear message from the government at the moment of emergence. So to me, it's probably an indication that the, the alternative model, the bottom-up model, uh, is uh, it's kind of flourishing. And, and of course, it, it's going to be hit by, by the economic downfall. But probably on the, in the longer run, it has better ch chances to, uh, to, recover, uh, to recover faster. OK, OK, thank you. Uh, I think the most interesting topic of the day now is the, the rate of uh, coronavirus de death in, uh, in Russia. And uh, I see lots of uh, different uh, opinions about the very strange statistic of, uh, of deaths. Uh, Russia is uh, now a third nation 
on the on the earth uh, uh, on the time of of quantity of of uh, cases of coronavirus, but with very very small statistic statistic of deaths and. Uh, Presumably, uh, Russian authorities uh, just just hide this this statistic. Back to uh, Raman Badanin, is it a uh, interest, interesting uh, interested um, issue for you? Are you working about it? Uh, are you have some uh, some possibility to to try to find uh, find something on this on this issue? I guess the nature of so-called Russian miracle is the biggest challenges for sure, the investigative speak about this Russian miracle. For the, for the investigative guys, yeah. Uh, well, as one of them, as an investigative journalist, I prefer to talk about something which have been already published uh, and <laughs> to hide some information which is still under construction. But, well, of course, I have some three possible ways of explanation basing on facts. Uh, first, I guess one of the reasons of this difference, I mean, the difference between uh, the death rate in Russia and the death rate uh, in some other countries uh, in the majority of European countries, uh, in the US, uh, one reason lies in the uh, statistic pattern, which is used in Russia and in post-Soviet countries and in, in other countries. I mean, I'm not, I'm not in the position to explain more specifically uh, what I mean. For example, uh, as far as we know, the Russian authorities uh, tend to register the death from pneumonia, for example, as the death from pneumonia, not the death from coronavirus. Uh, so the first uh, reason of the difference is the statistics, is the pattern of statistics. The second one is the difference in so-called average age rate. Uh, as far as you know, the average age in Russia is way more uh, lower than in the US or in Europe. For example, the average age of Russian men is something about 65 or 66. Uh, and for women, it's 72 or so. Uh, so it can explain that uh, we have no so old person uh, to suffer from coronavirus. And that's why it can affect the death rate. But of course, as an investigative guy, uh, I can admit that Russian authorities have some strategy to hide the real number of deaths. Uh, and of course, we are trying to, to dig into that. Uh, OK, thank you. Uh, it's now for, for Tichen, uh, my question is about, about sources. It's, uh, it's not so easy to have enough sources for uh, independent TV in Russia. But now it seems to be more or less catastrophic. You you can't uh, invite any, anybody in your uh, in your studio. Uh, what is your tactics? What is your strategy on the work with, with sources with with your your guests? Uh, TV channel can't can't exist without without guests, and uh, especially on the, on this kind of difficult subject uh, like. Uh, this uh, uh, mentioned by by uh, Raman Badanin, uh, all this uh, problem with uh, medicine with, with medicine people, with uh, uh, physicians, uh, with uh, uh, people who work directly on the red zone of coronavirus. 
uh, how do you manage to, uh, with your sources and your guests now? Well, uh, I don't see if, uh, it as a problem, the fact that we uh, cannot invite guests in our studio because everyone has uh, Skype, Zoom, Viber, Telegram, WhatsApp, or whatever to, to join the, uh, the new show, uh, news program. Uh, it's, it's, it looks worse than uh, when a person is uh, sitting next to you in the studio, but it's not a big deal now. Uh, what is a problem is um, the same problem that uh, Dorst and other independent media uh, has in, uh, let's call it normal life, is that almost no one from the government is ready to talk to us. Uh, for example, we're, we're, we're trying to get an official uh, comment uh, or uh, interview from uh, someone from uh, the um, office of a Russian mayor uh, during last five weeks, I guess. And still all we got is uh, promises and, uh, and, some, um, uh, and some words that absolutely, without any doubt, we will give you an interview, but call us tomorrow and then call the other day, call us next week, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, um, Speaking of uh, official information, what we got, we got from official sources um, uh, or uh, a little information from our sources uh, which are ready only to talk without mentioning their name. But uh, almost all the information that we have now and that our audience is uh, eager to receive and is uh, eager to, to, to read about it, is the information from uh, patients, from doctors, from uh, physicians from Russian regions. For example, we had a marathon last, last week. It was a marathon uh, in support of uh, Russian medics. And we get a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of stories, uh, a lot of information about how they work in Russian regions, about the conditions in which uh, they work, which are terrible. Uh, but, uh, uh, but answering to your question, the fact that they are not coming to the studio is not a problem. We all have Skype and Zoom. Uh, the fact that uh, our government still doesn't want to talk normally with the independent media is, is a big problem, uh, but there is nothing we can do with it, I, I guess. Uh, but fortunately, we see that people in, uh, in regions, they I think do not trust to official media and they trust to the independent media. That's why they are ready to talk to us and that's why they are the main source of information. That's very important to hear. Uh, I will ask Galina Timchenko, you personally is, is in Riga as uh, mm -hmm. some of your editors, but, but your journalists the most of your journalists is, is yeah, in Moscow in and, yeah. and in other Russian, uh, Russian cities. Uh, we have a question via Twitter from Danilo Gilperovich from Voice of America. So what is the situation with government approach to independent media? It's especially for you. Is it more well, aggressive, I, more relaxed or business as usual? Uh, you know, mm, you know can, I, uh, can I take one step back and... Uh, um, I, I, I want not to agree with Tihon absolutely, because a uh, uh, um, couple of days ago and and week ago we conducted a, a poll uh, and ask our audience to share with us their stories, and unfortunately almost all of them were anonymous. People are afraid yeah. to talk yeah. openly. Yeah, that's true. You know, that's true. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, I, I I'm far away from blaming doctors or physicians, but you know, uh, Russian authorities uh, every time they have partners in crime, we knew uh, by our own experience that in election in, in fake elections they had their partners in crime as teachers or heads of false commissions and so on. And in these days, unfortunately, they have their partners in crimes. Maybe it's not uh, voluntarily, but uh, 
uh, head of uh, health departments or uh, uh, chief uh, physicians, they are partners in crime because they are hiding diagnosis. They are hiding uh, the real numbers of death. And unfortunately, most of our speakers or newsmakers, they want to speak anonymously. Uh, and uh, may I return to uh, the question about government. From the one side, they are tireless of uh, pressing us and pushing us and uh, something like this, because even uh, in the days, uh, during the days of uh, uh, such crucial epidemic, epidemic situation, they put on, uh, on the table the questions about Medusa and other uh, um, independent media, uh, about fake news, so-called fake news. Even today, RT, Rush Today, published news that Medusa is spreading fake news. And they then they will repeat our news. Uh, wow. So, uh, and uh, all uh, this situation is the same. Uh, um, State Duma trying uh, to put pressure on us, uh, state uh, or um, some... Yes, the first, the first of April, the first of April, a special law about coronavirus yeah, fake yeah, news yeah, was adopted. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Sure. absolutely. And they are trying uh, to stop us uh, uh, informing our audience about real situation. We are trying to do our best, so catch me if you can. And this uh, cat and mouse play continuing day by day. Okay. Thank you, Galina. Uh, another question from uh, our audience. Uh, it's uh, Anthony Moret uh, asking for Dr. Yudin. Uh, Dr. Yudin speaks uh, of a foreign top-down model for communication, government to people. On the pandemic ends, what might be the effect of this? Perhaps the journalists could address that top-down question too. Uh, well, actually, that's that's precisely what I think uh, is is happening now because the the independent media, the media that are assumed to uh, to uh, behave in a in a more horizontal way, they are kind of uh, assuming this function of uh, uh, informing the the people, and that's why I think that actually explains pretty well uh, why there is. Uh, this kind of increase uh, in in the readership on on the coronavirus issues, uh, on the statistics, on the models, and all the stuff that people would wouldn't be normally interested in, uh, simply because uh, they're lacking uh, information on this uh, vital uh, vital issue. And uh, just going back to to Tichon's comment uh, that the officials are not willing to uh, to talk to to. Uh, to rain TV. Uh, well, the, there's there's a much uh, more serious problem uh, out there now that the apparently officials are not willing to talk to anyone, and we are only seeing very very limited uh, input from uh, from the officials on the on the official media, uh, except for. Or I would uh, say on a radio station like of Moscow. Uh, yep. I mean, uh, the, the, the only exception is perhaps, is perhaps the, the, the authorities in Moscow are at least trying to, uh, to develop a uh, like more user-friendly way of uh, communicating information. But they're uh, still, I guess, failing badly because they still don't have an official spokesperson uh, about, uh, on, on coronavirus. So I don't think that's, that's, that's an issue of like, ignoring uh, the rain TV. Uh, the the major issue is that they don't have a consistent uh, policy, a consistent message that would be communicated to to the people. I mean, there are many instances of that. Uh, the 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 most recent one is that to, uh, from today on, we have uh, in many regions this uh, uh, this decree obliging people to wear masks, and uh, there is no clarification so far uh, what what is actually the uh, the right way to wear masks. Uh, what is the right way to change them? why actually this, this measure is uh, required at all. So that's, uh, that's, a huge, uh, that's a huge problem in communication, uh, in communication of the government strategy. Okay, thank you. And uh, maybe uh, the next question is uh, for all the three of uh, our journalists. Uh, all the three are 
more or less uh, uh, from capital journalism, from, from centralized journalism. But uh, one of uh, our, uh, our uh, question from our audience, uh, it's a Raman Zaharov from Glasnost Defense Foundation. Because the problem, that, that's the question, because the problem of sources is even more critical for independent regional media than for federal projects, is it not the right time for more active cooperation? Uh, for example, uh, syndication of, mat uh, of materials. What is your, for all you, you three editor in chiefs, what is your uh, vision uh, about uh, today's uh, provincial Russian journalism, uh, about cooperation with, with our colleagues outside Moscow, outside St. Petersburg? Uh, what is your vision uh, about the pressure of local power to uh, our local colleagues? Uh, can you can you speak about it? No. Galia? Okay. Yeah. Can, can, can I start? Uh, you know, it's a, a real good a good question because uh, maybe a month ago, a Nova Gazeta and the editor in chief of Nova Gazeta, Dmitry Muratov, they launched a new project called Syndicate uh, One Hundred, and uh, who um, should join uh, the efforts of independent media all across the Russia. And we took part in uh, the first meeting, and uh, uh, our deputy editor in chief, Tatiana Lasola, helped uh, to write some kind of code uh, of uh, conduct, uh, code of conduct, uh, conduct code of this syndicate. And we are trying to share information. And it's it's really helpful because we have special chat and Tihon, it seems to me he is inside and we have special chat. Uh, they share their actual publication and we could spread it to our audience and TV Rain and Medusa, we have a big audience so we could spread local news to our audience and then we gather data for our tables or for our maps and it's really helpful. And today we have, uh, it seems to me a very symbolic um, uh, publication because four of uh, Russian media, Vedomosti, Forbes, The Bell and Medusa, we published at the same time a uh, big investigation about a situation in Vedomosti, independent, ex-independent newspaper Vedomosti, and about the role of Rosneft and Igor Sechin in the crisis inside Vedomosti. It was... Uh, it seems to me that in some way, this uh, COVID uh, situation, this epidemic, uh, show us that we could finally <laughs> forget about our uh, quarrels and about all, all the situation and to combine our efforts to spread the real information. Thank you, Galina. Uh, Roman, you will continue well, about, uh, about, oh. about local Russian journalists. Uh, well, long story short, I don't know a lot about the uh, the situation in Russian regions, uh, but I can imagine that the pressure uh, that the pressure is huge, actually huge. Uh, and I heard about some instances uh, when the Russian regional media uh, felt into disgrace uh, of regional authorities. And it ended up with uh, big troubles for them. Uh, so, my generally speaking, my view is I believe in two things: uh, in cooperation and in competition. Uh, so, and I believe in a good mix of these two substances. I would say. Thanks. Uh, you have lots of correspondents outside outside Moscow, more than, than normal or less than normal. What is your relations with with uh, uh, journalists outside Moscow now? Sorry, it was a trouble. No, no, yeah, it was. Okay, okay. Uh, so uh, well, we we don't have a lot of uh, reporters outside of Moscow. Uh, we have uh, some stringers, uh, the, uh, how it is called in Russia, 
uh, reporters uh, in the regions who are ready to work uh, for us. But uh, but I, I actually I don't have anything to add to what uh, Galia just said, uh, Galina Simchuk, that uh, this uh, Syndicate 100 is a uh, surprisingly uh, ex surprisingly exists over two months already, which is a big deal for uh, a Russian independent media. Uh, it is um, it is a big surprise that still no one left syndicate or no one uh, accused other members of syndicate in uh, all the scenes. Uh, and uh, that's true that now we see that this syndicate is uh, working as the um, instrument for us in Moscow or in Riga to get information from Ural or Siberia uh, because uh, journalists from uh, independent media there, they are sharing our, they are sharing their uh, publications, their articles with us, which in other case we would miss. And that's how we share these publications with our audience. We call we call the journalists who wrote this uh, article, we call the heroes of, of uh, this article. So I think that surprisingly, this situation is, uh, the, uh, um, is a good example of how Russian independent media could work together uh, in, the, in, the, in the time of, of a disaster. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tihan. We had some problems with yeah, Mike. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, thanks, thanks, Ethan. Uh, speaking about the Russian regions, and, uh, and uh, we see this uh, so some on the period of coronavirus, we see this uh, strange Russian uh, forced federalism, uh, this strange, strange uh, situation when uh, um, Russian uh, Kremlin power refuse to decide uh, lots of different uh, important things and uh, push the right to decide this and the obligation to decide this to to um, to regions to uh, governors of uh, of Russian of Russian region. Uh, is it uh, change something on the life of uh, of uh, Russian media? Normally, it's very centralized. Uh, all uh, all the legislation, all the practices uh, of Russian of uh, Russian uh, Russian authorities uh, to to Russian media. Uh, can we see some differences between different regions? Can we see some federalism on some de decentralization on uh, on this matter now uh, uh, in terms of information, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, free of uh, free, freedom of media, me, media freedom of speech, and uh, so on. Maybe it's for Greg Yudin now. Uh, well, actually, uh, I must confess I'm not aware of the uh, specific situation in uh, in uh, in Russian in various Russian regions concerning media. What I would uh, like to comment on here is that obviously there is. Uh, uh, federalization is too hard a word for, for that uh, because federalization or decentralization implies uh, the distribution of resources and uh, not only of the duties and obligations. Uh, Russia is obviously a hyper centralized country uh, and mm, first of all uh, in financial terms uh, the most of the regions are, are critically dependent uh, on the finance coming from uh, from Moscow, and they first they first channel in the the money uh, to the capital, and they get the money back. Uh, so until we have uh, a reform uh, in uh, a, a kind of financial decentralization reform, I think it's too early to speak of uh, of real federalization in the country. But I don't know much about the the situation in media. Okay, guys, we have uh, last two, two, two minutes to, to our, uh, last 10 minutes to our conversation. And uh, I will remember to our audience, please send your question by email 
Canon at wilsoncenter.org or Twitter, Canon Institute or Facebook, Facebook page. Uh, but uh, I will I will ask about uh, if if we if we speak about uh, about Russian uh, region, maybe the most important, most difficult things. It's uh, a Russian North Caucasus and uh, Chechnya and uh, in other uh, regions uh, 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 and uh, in other region, regions on, uh, on Caucasus. Uh, what do you think about uh, journalists there? What do you think about about information information there? Uh, it seems to me that that the Chechnya for Chechnya, for example is absolutely isolated from Russia on the time of, of uh, epidemic, epidemic more than on the, on the normal time. Do you have this uh, vision uh, to uh, what is your information about, about uh, the Kazan situation? Uh, may I start? Uh, we made a reporting uh, from Chechnya and Dagestan and a little bit in Gushetia. And it, it seems to me it's horrible because we have just just anonymous sources of information. And it seems to me that all numbers from these regions and all measures are covered up as tight as possible. We have no proved information uh, about medical statistics, about uh, counting of deaths, about counting on, on uninfected people, and uh, we just uh, uh, reported uh, about um, about some restrictions and about some human rights violations in these regions, and about violation of freedom of speech for sure. And it seems to me uh, we could uh, we could we could know something about this maybe in a half a year, maybe after the epidemic will uh, um, uh, finished or something like this. Uh, unfortunately, our reporting is not enough at all. Uh, and we have no chance to uh, give proved uh, and verified information from there. Yes, I, I just wanted to add that I think that pandemic, the situation with the uh, covering of a pandemic is not uh, very much different from the situation in uh, covering anything else in the Russian regions. I mean, we all know that North Caucasus, uh, Chechnya especially, uh, or for example, the south of Russia, Krasnodarsky Krai, uh, they are the uh, um, they are the uh, territories with its own laws, the territories without. Uh, without uh, any serious or without any independent media at all. And uh, that's, that's why from North Caucasus, we get less information about the real situation with the pandemic, as, uh, just as well as we get less information from North Caucasus about the situation with uh, human rights in normal life. So I don't think that now we see that the situation is is changing. It is still with uh, the same in big in big cities like I don't know Moscow, Saint Petersburg, Yekaterinburg, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We 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 get a lot of information from these cities because there are a lot of uh, not a lot of but there are some independent media. Uh, there is a lot of bloggers. There is a lot of people who are not afraid to talk. And in uh, North Caucasus, especially in Chechnya, for example, uh, from this region, we get much less information because people are afraid there, but they, are, but they became being afraid not now. They, they became being afraid years ago. Uh, Raban, you have to say something? Uh, answering your question on more... Uh, answering your question on more philosophical level, I would say the <laughs> coronavirus outbreak has worsened all the troubles that Russia has had before. I mean, uh, did the coronavirus worsen the situation with the freedom of speech in Russia? Yes, definitely. Uh, did the coronavirus affect the situation with the relations between different uh, 
authorities, I mean, this federal in question. Yes, it did. It's the same question with the troubled regions. First of all, North Caucasus. Yes, of course, Chechnya was always not a complete part of Russian Federation. But now it's completely isolated at all. You are right. So it's the same with all the questions we can just count and count and count. Uh, and, and that's why the coronavirus situation is the most, I would say, productive time for journalists. Because we have a lot of things to do. We have a lot of things to dig in. Maybe, maybe my last question today, uh, but uh, it's about uh, the news of uh, news of the fresh news, more or less fresh from from yesterday, the the last declaration of Vladimir Putin. Uh, it was something strange uh, in terms uh, of 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 intonation, in, in terms of psychology, with uh, very strange, unusual language for Russian president. It was also something strange in terms of, uh, of, uh, uh, of decision, because uh, I think almost nobody don't understand uh, clearly what was the idea of Putin is today is the first working day in Russia for everybody or not everybody. Uh, is uh, Russian economy and Russian society restart to to or, or functioning or not? So, uh, what is your approach about about uh, yesterday's decision and yesterday's announcement of uh, uh, of Putin? Is uh, the is maybe Russia have the famous uh, Swedish way? Uh, on on this uh, on this coronavirus with absolutely open society situation uh, uh, against the against the uh, epidemic uh, or maybe it, it's uh, it's uh, still still be closed. What's what is you what is your idea about the tactics of Russian uh, uh, Russian authorities uh, now after yesterday's speech of Putin? You know, uh, you, you said the very precise word, tactics. You know, I feel myself uh, like Cassandra. I want to sure. say, I did no, say No this. strategy, absolutely, absolutely. No strategy no. at all for all these years. And uh, this situation, this outbreak just mirrored the main problem of Putin's regime. They have no strategy at all. They have only tactics. They have only, they reflected uh, the situation, but they have no decisions at all. And yesterday's speech of Putin just showed us, it's absolutely clear. They, ha they have no will to make any decisions. They have no will to take responsibility for the country. They have no will uh, to do something. They have no will uh, to open uh, this uh, stabilization uh, foundation yeah, for uh, to share money with people or uh, to compensate something. They have no will at all. It seems to me they just reflected, and that's the main problem. And we could see easily that there is blood on the rug. The, uh, the fight uh, between Kremlin Towers began. Uh, one part blames Sabanian and Moscow that he took power. The, the other uh, tower um, put all responsibilities for the regions, Russian regions. And we only see this uh, moving rug with bulldogs under it <laughs> and that's all they have no plan for russia and they have no uh, rescue plan unfortunately that's my point of view thank you guys it, uh, our time is over thank you everybody <laughs> i feel the show sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no it's okay it's okay thank you Gala. uh thank you everybody thank you to our thank you so much today. thanks uh, thank you guys thank and thank you to every, thank you everyone all. tuning to in to today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Bye-bye.